Right, so next speaker, next speaker is uh, Tali Schrott, who uh, is probably the world's leading authority on optimism and our natural sort of calibration, which causes us to be uh, biased towards uh, slight optimism. I spoke to another evolutionary biologist, a man called Robert Trivers, who said that he was always convinced this was the greatest source of human uh, happiness and misfortune, was our natural bias this way. Um, so I'd love to know a little bit more about this. If you're, if you, I'll, give you, I'll give you 30 seconds just to seat yourselves. Is that about right? Yes, we're just about, we're just about reaching a kind of equilibrium here. So it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Telly Sherrott. Thank you very much indeed. Big hand, folks. Whoop, there we are. Here we are. Oh, sorry. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Thank you ever so much. Hello. So, um, thank you for inviting me. I am a cognitive neuroscientist, which is a field in the intersection between neuroscience and psychology. Um, and in my lab, we study human behavior, and we try to understand the brain mechanisms that give rise to how people act every day, how they interact, how they make decisions. So today, I want to share with you um, some of the things that we've learned about what really changes people's minds and behaviors, and some of the common approaches that don't seem to work very well. And if you think about it, any time you're trying to change someone's behavior, or any time you're giving advice, what you're really trying to do is change their future. Right? You say, eat well today so that you'll be healthy tomorrow. Or invest in my project today so that in a few years you'll make more money. Or don't smoke today so then you don't die young. So if we're ever to convince anyone of everything, the first thing we really need to understand is how people think about the future. Because we really need to understand what goes on inside someone's mind if we ever consider changing it. Um, so the first study that I ever did uh, to look at this question was about a decade ago, and I was interested in how people imagine really terrible, negative, traumatic events that may happen to them in the future. And I had a very simple plan, extremely simple. I was going to put people in the scanner, and I would give them really negative events to imagine. And I was going to look at what happens in their brain. But then something very unexpected happened. Every time I gave people negative events to imagine, they twisted and turned them to make something positive. So for example, I would say, imagine the breakup of a romantic relationship, and one guy said, I broke up with my girlfriend, and then I found a much better one. <laughs> or I would say, um, imagine getting stuck out of your apartment with no keys, and one person said, I got stuck out of my apartment, and then I called the landlady, she came with a key, and she let me in. So I was extremely annoyed. Um, as you can imagine, they were ruining my experiment. So for about two months, I tried and tried different instructions and different events to get people to imagine these negative events. And it took me about two months to realize that actually this may be really interesting. Um, so I looked into the literature, and it turns out that in social psychology and behavioral economics, there was something that was known as the optimism bias, which basically means that people imagine the future to be better than the past and the present, and that people underestimate the likelihood of negative events happening to them and overestimate the likelihood of positive events. So let's do a little bit experiment to kind of um, show what this means. So I'm gonna ask you to think about your own future five years from now, 10 years from now, uh, think about your family, think about your careers, and I'm going to ask you four questions. Number one, if you're currently married, what is the likelihood that you will be divorced? 0%, 10%, 50%, 90%? So don't share it with us, just keep it in your mind. <laughs> Number two, how optimistic are you about the future of your own family? Slightly optimistic, mildly optimistic, very optimistic. Number three, how optimistic are you about the other families in this room? And number four, what do you think your prospects are financially and professionally? And now let's see how most people answer these questions. So we'll start with marriage. So in the Western world, divorce rates are at least 40%. That means that out of every five couples walking down the aisle, two will end up splitting their assets. But when you ask newlyweds about their own likelihood of divorce, they estimated at 
And even divorce lawyers, who should really know better, hugely underestimate their own likelihood of divorce. So it turns out that optimists are not less likely to divorce, but they are more likely to remarry. In the words of Samuel Johnson, remarriage is a triumph of hope over experience. So if we're married, statistically, we're more likely to have kids. And we all think that our kids will be especially talented. Um, this, by the way, is an old photo of my uh, nephew, Guy. And he's a very bad example of the optimism bias because he is um, especially talented. <laughs> and I'm not alone. So out of every four British people, three said that they were optimistic about the future of their own families. That's 75%. But only 30% said that they thought that people in general are doing better than a few generations ago. And that is a really important point. Because people are optimistic about themselves, and they're optimistic about their friends and, and their family, but they're not so optimistic about the guy sitting next to them. And we're somewhat pessimistic about the future of our country, the future of um, the market, our ability of our leaders. And one reason for that is control. So people believe they have quite a bit of control over their own lives, over their own future, and so they can steer the wheel in the right direction. But we don't think we have control over the future of our country. We don't think we have control of what our leaders do. So we're not so optimistic in the public domain. However, private optimism about our own personal future, that remains quite persistent. Take small businesses, for example. So in the US, out of every three small businesses, only one will remain standing in five years. That's 33%. But when you ask small business owners about their own likelihood of success, 81% says that they will remain standing in five years. So that means that 50% are going to be unexpectedly um, surprised. So the question is, how do we maintain this optimism in the face of reality? Because we go through life experiencing positive events, but also negative events. And we read the newspapers, and we know what's going on. So how do we maintain it? So after studying this question for quite a lot of years, um, the very scientific answer that I found was this. So when something threatens us, when we get some negative news, or someone tells us that our work is not very um, good, what we tend to do is rationalization distancing ourselves from the truth, and simply trying to, to find uh, faults in that um, argument or that information. Let's take, for example, the financial market. So this is a study that was conducted by Carlson, Lowenstein, and Seppi, three behavioral economists. And what they were interested in was when do people log into their accounts to check on their stocks? So not to make a transaction without any intent to make a transaction, just to check how much they're worth. So what you're seeing here in black is the S&P 500 over two years. And in gray is the number of times that people logged into their accounts. And these are not raw numbers. They've been corrected for all the obvious confounds like market volume and willingness to transact. So what do we see? When the market is high, people log in all the times. And when the market is low, people avoid logging in. Now, this is a field study. We're not sure why this is, but what these offers suggest is that when the market is high, you expect your own stocks to rise in price. So you look into your account to get a little bit of good news to make yourself feel good. And when the market is low, you expect your own stocks to go down. You expect the negative news. And so you just avoid it in order not to feel bad. And all this is true as long as negative news can be reasonably avoided. So what you don't see here is what happened a few months later in the financial collapse of 2008 when the market went drastically down. And that's when people started logging in frantically. But it was a little bit too late. So in my lab, we wanted to know what type of information really changes people's beliefs and what type of information is simply ignored. And so we conducted an experiment where we had people come into the lab, and we showed them all sorts of negative events that may happen to them. And we said, what is the likelihood that this event will happen to you? So what is the likelihood that you will be robbed? 
And then we told them the average likelihood for someone like them living in their city, in their age, so robbery in London is about 30%. And then we asked them again, what is the likelihood that you will be robbed? And 80 different other events. Because we wanted to know whether people would take the information that we gave them to change their beliefs. And indeed, they did. But mostly when the information that we gave them was better than expected. So for example, if someone said, my likelihood of being robbed is about 50%, and we said, hey, the average likelihood is 30%, good news. The next time around, they would say, well, maybe it's only 35%. So they learned quite quickly. But if someone was to say, my average likelihood of being robbed is about 10%, and we said, hey, bad news, the average likelihood is 30%, the next time around, they would say, yeah, still think it's about 11%. So it's not that they didn't learn at all, they did, but they learned much less when we gave them bad news relative to when we gave them good news. And it's not that they didn't remember the information that we gave them, they all remembered the average likelihood of Alzheimer's, divorce, and robbery, um, but they didn't think it was related to them when it was worse than expected, but they thought it was related to them when it was better than expected. And we did this um, inside the fMRI scanner because we were interested what goes on inside the human brain that makes us resistant to negative information. And what we found was that many regions in the brain were responding to good news. They were encoding this positive information, including this region here that's called the left inferior frontal gyrus, so it's here. And it didn't, remember, didn't matter what type of person you were. You could be very optimistic, or even you can be slightly depressed. Everyone's brain was responding to positive information. On the other side of the brain, the right inferior frontal gyrus was responding to negative information. And it wasn't doing such a good job. And the more optimistic someone was, according to trait questionnaires, the less likely this region was to respond to negative information. Now, if our brain is not encoding negative information as well, we will remain with a positive image of ourselves. And so, the um, problem is that instead of going along with this image that people so effortfully maintain, we try to put a clear mirror in front of them. We try to say, hey, this image is gonna get uglier and uglier, but it doesn't work. It doesn't work because the brain will frantically try to distort the image using Photoshop and fancy lenses until it gets the image it's happy with. But what will happen if we went along without how brain works and not against it. So let me give you one example of how we can do that. So this was a study um, conducted in a hospital in um, the east coast of the United States where they wanted to see how often medical staff sanitize their hands before and after entering a patient's room. So they had a camera installed um, above every room to see how often the medical staff wash their hands. Okay, you get ready for that. Um, so the medical staff knew that the camera was installed. Nevertheless, only one in 10 medical staff washed their hands before and after entering a patient's room. But then an intervention was introduced, an electronic board that told the medical staff how well they were doing. Every time the medical staff washed their hands, the numbers went up immediately on the board. And what happened? Compliance raised to almost 90%, which is quite amazing. In fact, it's so amazing that you may be a little bit suspicious, and so were uh, the research team, so they made sure to replicate it in another division in the hospital. Here, the medical staff started at 30%, which is more like the national average. Then the electronic board was introduced, and again, it went straight to 90%. So the question is, why did this intervention work so well? And this is really the general question here. And the answer is not about hospitals and not about washing hands. The answer is much more general than that. It works well because instead of using the normal approach, what would be the normal approach? The normal approach would be to highlight disease, 
highlight the bad things that can happen in the future, right? Instead of using that approach, they use a totally different approach that uses free principles that we know really change people's mind and behavior. And you're probably aware of those principles as well. So let me tell you what they are. They're not new. The first one is immediate rewards. Every time the medical staff washed their hands, the numbers went up immediately on the board. It was positive feedback, and the ma it made the medical staff feel good. Knowing that in advance made them want to do something that they otherwise wouldn't do. And this works because of a principle of our brain that's called the principle of approach and avoidance. So when we see a reward in front of us, our immediate reaction is to rush towards it. Right? We approach, we act. In fact, you don't even have to have the reward in front of you. Thinking that maybe, possibly, there will be a reward in the future, maybe there's a chocolate cake in the fridge, is enough to get people to act. So our brain has evolved in an environment where the good stuff, whether it's success or love or chocolate cake or positive feedback, is you can get that by approaching, by acting. And so in our brain, the reward system is tightly connected to our motor system. And when we expect something good, a go reaction is triggered. We act. On the other hand, when there's something bad in front of us, our immediate reaction is to avoid it, to turn away. And so our brain has evolved in an environment where the bad stuff, poison, deep waters, untrustworthy people, are most often avoided by simply not getting anywhere near them. And so in the brain, we have a circuit that's called the no-go system, where expecting something bad inhibits action. And so you can see why warning people of something bad that can happen in the future does not get you the reaction you want. And this is even worse in the case where this bad thing may or may not happen in the future because our optimistic brain concludes that maybe I'll be okay anyway. I won't wash my hands, but I might not actually spread disease. And on the other hand, you can see how a positive feedback, the expectations of something good, can get people to do all sorts of things. So there are plenty of studies showing that warnings have very limited effect on behavior, especially when what you're trying to do is get people to act rather than not act. Um, and in the hospital study, instead of using warnings, they used positive strategies. So the first one was immediate rewards, but there were two other. Okay. There were two other strategies. So they used social incentives. Every time the, par the medical staff washed their hands, they could see how well they were doing, but they could also see how well everyone else were doing, right? They could see the current shift rate and the weekly rate. We know we're social people. We care what other people are doing. We want to do the same. We want to do it better. The third one was progress monitoring. Instead of highlighting disease, instead of saying employees must wash their hands, they were highlighting progress. They were highlighting how people can become better. Let me uh, show you an example of how these three strategies um, is used in a very different context. So one day I got um, home to our apartment in Boston, and I saw this um, bill pasted on my fridge. Now, I was very surprised because we never have bills on our fridge, so I was wondering why my husband put it on our fridge. And looking at this bill carefully, what I could see was that what this bill was trying to do it was trying to get me to be more efficient with my electricity use. And how was it doing it? Social incentives, immediate rewards, and progress monitoring. So here's my social incentive. In blue is my use of electricity. In gray is the average use of electricity in my neighborhood. And in green is the uh, use of electricity of the most efficient neighbor. And so my reaction to that is, optimistically, hey, I'm a little bit better than average, and also, I really want to get to that green bar. So that's my social incentive. And here's my immediate reward. It's really small, I don't know if you can see it, but it's a little smiley face, and it says good, and it makes me really want to put this bill on my fridge. But even smaller than that, I don't know if you can see, above it, 
there's an option to get two smiley faces and it says great. <laughs> and here is my progress monitoring. So I can see how well I was doing over the um, year. And finally, what this bill was doing, it gave me a sense of control. It gave me a sense that I am in control of my electricity use. I'm in control of my own uh, future. No one's telling me what to do. No one's threatening me. It's not employees must wash their hands. It is up to me to decide. And we all we know that one of the principles of what the brain is always trying to do is to control its environment. So giving someone a sense of control, even if it's perceived control, is a great way to um, get people to act. So the bottom line um, is this. If you're trying to change behaviors now, that may lead to really bad stuff later, you are facing two problems. The first problem is the optimistic brain, because people will say, hmm, I'll behave badly now, but maybe I'll avoid the bad stuff later, right? And the other problem is that highlighting the negative stuff in the future, highlighting threats and so on, may cause passivity. But one thing we may be able to do is just to frame the message differently. Instead of highlighting how things can get worse, instead of highlighting the possibility of decline, highlighting what we need to do in order to get to progress. And I'll leave you with that. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you very much indeed. What? So, I mean, I, it's something actually, that this is a lesson I think the advertising industry learnt very late, partly because I think you've got a lot of plaudits for scaremongering advertising that emphasised the negative because it just seemed more dramatic and was more award-worthy and so forth. Um, it, was, it was eventually parodied by, by someone who actually just had a, someone holding out a dead dog and it said, here's a dead dog, now where's my award? Um, now, uh, why do you think... Uh, why do you think we're wired that way? Is there some um, no longer appropriate evolutionary sort of, uh, how would I describe it? I mean, are, are we sort of conditioned for some reason that it was historically advantageous for us to be uh, just um, uh, you know, mildly dismissive of remote threats, as it were? In other words, do we have time horizons that are too narrow for the modern world, for example? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, when, when you look at the optimism bias, you can see the positive and you can see the negative, right? Yeah. So, the positive is that people who are more optimistic, and I have to say, okay, we had this chat before, most people have a mild optimism bias, so it's not crazy, okay? Yeah. So, we're just slightly overestimating the positive, slightly underestimating the, the negative. Um, so, it's not kind of a, a crazy, although there are people who are a bit... Crazily optimistic. Yeah. Um, so the positive thing is that positive expectations reduces stress and anxiety, and that leads to better health. So there's plenty of studies showing that mildly optimistic people tend to be healthier, they live longer, they survive um, more months following cancer, AIDS, and so on. So that's like a simple explanation okay, for why that is. Um, and then the other thing is motivation. So if we expect to do well, we put more time and effort into it, right? Ah. Um, and we also explore. You can think, you know, very hand-wavy back in the day. Um, you'd have to get out of your cave to go and try and find food. And to do that, you have to underestimate your risk to some extent as well. In order to get out of Africa to explore the rest of the world, we have to imagine that there's something wonderful for us to find. Um, and so, again, studies show that it is the optimistic people who are more successful um, and explore more and so on. On the other side, of course, there's a risk, right? I'm overly optimistic. I underestimate my risk. I don't take precautionary action. So that's a negative. So I think probably, given that there's positive and negative, my, I, I would imagine that over evolution, the positive probably outweighed the negative such that it was more advantageous. It was more advantageous to be calibrated a little bit that way. Right. Because the there's another issue, isn't there, which is I think that the, the, the only people you find who are completely objective about the probability of things are people with depression. Is this right? Uh, absolutely. So people with mild depression 
it's not that they're, they don't have a bias either way. It doesn't ah. mean that they're always right. No. They can make errors, but they can make errors to both directions. Ah, I see. And it is the people who are severely depressed which have a pessimistic bias. So they ah. systematically expect things to be worse than they are. And they are the ones who stay at home and don't go out. Because if everything's terrible, I'm not going to get out of my bed. I'm going to not try to do anything. Ah, and see. then it becomes a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy. prophecy. Of course, I see. So, I mean, this, um, I mean there, may be, there may be a sort of signalling element to it as well, is there, mm. which is that, in other words, uh, one thing that would make you both attractive and trustworthy to other people would be apparent faith in futurity in that way, that it, it, is, it might just be an attractive quality in other people for a variety of reasons. I mean, you, you mentioned the, you know, the chance of marriage. You can't really get married and say, You're, I'm playing the odds here. You know, that there's a degree of sort of commitment there where you have to at least display absolute faith um, for the whole institution to work. Right. Yeah. And, and at the end of the day, you can get divorced, but it's not... I mean, you could still have a good marriage for a few years. So yes. yeah. I think it's OK to have sometimes um, overly positive expectations because if you don't have them, as you say, you might not do all these things you do that will to have with. positive yeah. as well as, as negative. Yeah. Ah, and, and also, I suppose, if you, if, if you want to demonstrate commitment then enthusiasm demonstrates commitment much more than, um, uh, you know, I mean, you, know, you, can't, you can't imagine marriage vows which were, which were kind of written in a mealy-mouthed way. You know, it says for richer, for poorer. Yeah. It's not written in a way that says, you know, conditional on. I mean, I, you know, I mean, I think most people, you know, most people in Britain find uh, uh, what, what you might call, uh, what are those strange things, uh, clauses, the legal things, uh, um, before, prenup, prenup, yeah. find them slightly, uh, because it, it, it's essentially going into something with, with the expectation of failure. There's something deeply yeah. disquieting no, I, 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 yeah. I totally agree with that. But then related to that is a theory that we have optimism in order to convince others that we're right. So if you believe yourself, that if you're ah. overconfident, but that means that you believe yourself that you're likely to succeed, then I'm going to convince other people so that's the Robert Trivers thing, that we delude exactly. ourselves. Robert Trivers. And I think it's a good yeah. theory. There's not tons of, of data um, showing that that's right. It's very hard to test. He's got some um, more. He's coming, coming to London in, uh, I think, October. So I'll, uh, I'll, publicize the, I'll publicize that talk. Question. Sorry, I've been monopolizing you. Gentleman there, first. Um, so uh, is there any longer-term study about the effects of these uh, immediate rewards and social incentives? So say I work in the hospital and I'm... Uh, these come in and I stop and I wash my hands and I get my, my points for a couple of weeks. If then I forget one day and my score drops, do I then stop doing it? Do I then think, oh, well, I did that for a bit. It was fun, but actually I'm bored of it now. Yeah, so that study goes on for a few months. So we know that's, a, that's good for a few months. I don't know how long, you know, if it, it will work for years. There are now quite a few health studies showing, um, actually most of them are done here in the UK. So you give people money to stop smoking, um, especially also pregnant women, um, not to drink, to stop smoking. And those studies show that after you stop the reward, people still do the healthy behavior, including like going to the gym and so on. So I think what happens is that in order to get you to do something healthy, like go to the gym, at first I give you rewards, and then it becomes a habit. It becomes part of your day. And that's why many times you can see people go on and do the same thing. So you need to have it enough time for people to have it as a habit and to see the, the reward in the natural rewards, right? By not smoking or by not drinking and so on. I mean, when you're pregnant, otherwise drinking has its own rewards. But. Um, <laughs> But then you can, have, you can see the other rewards. Right? I go to the gym, I can see, oh, I feel better, and so on. And so that's a reward in and of itself. Okay, but thanks. The first push. Uh, lady, Emily, is it? The, yeah, thank you. Hi, thanks for that. Uh, great talk. Um, I have a question about gender and calibration. So I did a study once on small business, medium-sized business owners. Um, and it was very well controlled in the sample between the men and the women. There was no difference in terms of the size of the business or the profit before tax or number of employees. But if you ask the women, um, you know, rate on a scale from struggling to prospering how well your business is doing, you get what you might expect, a normal distribution. When you ask men, you get something totally different. <laughs> you get a massive skew towards prospering. Um, I was wondering if you find similar effects. Yeah, so I get this question a lot. We never find any gender effects, but we never go after them. So I think you need a large population to do it. 
My suspicion is that the basic mechanisms are the same, that women are optimistically biased just like men are optimistically biased, but perhaps you will see it more in the domain that is more important for them or maybe traditionally more important for them. So perhaps you see um, male more optimistic or overconfident in the domain of business just because traditionally it was a male domain. And maybe if you look at other domains and females, you'll, you'll see that. You'll see an optimistic by that. But we don't. When we look at the basic mechanisms, we don't see a difference. Gentleman there. Sorry, I'm being very favoritist towards this part of the uh, audience. But it does keep the mic in the same place. And I'll, I'll come back to this area next. I'll do one extra question. Sorry. I just wanted to ask about whether this is a universal thing. Um, so, for example, one of the things I came across in my own research is the idea that the, the level, levels of sort of the, the, more people nowadays think they're special and think they're kind of imp important and destined to play a great part in, it's in a the world effect, than, isn't it? Yeah, than they did sort of 50 years ago. Ha, have there been studies over time to show where the levels of op optimism and also it, are the, does, does the level of optimism vary between cultures? Yeah, okay. So um, between cultures, um, so it doesn't seem that there is great differences. What I found in my research, because I did research in, in Israel and the US and the UK, I found that what matters um, is not how optimistically biased you are, but how you think you are. Um, so in the UK or in France, for example, um, people believe it's better not to be optimistic, right? People say, oh, and then people come into the lab and say, oh, I'm a realist, I'm a pessimist. Um, but then you do the experiments and you find they're just as optimistic as anyone else. In the US, being optimistic is good, right? So people come in they're and they're like, I'm opinion. optimistic. Yeah. Um, yeah. But at the end of the day, there's no difference. So I think the difference is a metacognitive difference, how optimistic you think you are, but no, not how optimistic you actually are. And the other difference that has been recorded is that in Asian cultures, Back in the day, it was really hard to find the optimism bias, which seemed a bit odd, because by the way, you can see it in animals. There are some really interesting studies in animals showing an optimistic bias. So that was kind of odd. How come, how come Asia is not, not optimistic? Well, then it turns out that they were asking the wrong question, because it's not an individualistic culture, and they were asking about the individual. They didn't see as much of an optimism bias. But once they asked about the group, about the village, then they got the bias. Um, and Shall I answer? Yeah, there's an age question there, which uh, I'll answer really quickly. So we find that age is really interesting. So teenagers and kids are quite optimistic, and then it starts going down, 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 hidden um, bottom at your midlife. So 40 and 50, people are the least optimistic and the least happy as well. It goes together. And then it starts going up again. So um, in older age, we find that people are both optimistic and happy as well. Um, so there is kind of a U shape there. Which you wouldn't expect, necessarily. Yeah, would you? you wouldn't. Yeah. But, but yeah, it's quite interesting. Happiness, is, it goes like that. So if you're in midlife, there's good news because things are going to get better. <laughs> we'll end with that. Right, finally, one more. I've, I've been, gentleman with a beard, I think. was it, uh, Yeah. Uh, so we talk, you talked a lot about optimism as <clears throat> almost an automatic process that your brain undertakes, not necessarily without your control. Could you talk a little bit about the difference between optimism and, say, positivity or positive thinking where you're actively applying constructive thoughts and reactions to things that are going on around you? Yeah, so it's true. My belief is it's quite automatic, um, not something that you make yourself do. And it's really hard to change. I think it's really hard to change beliefs um, on your own to like, make yourself think something positive or negative. That's why some nudges can be helpful. Um, but let me just, yeah, you're asking what's the difference between optimism, positivity, and all of that. So optimism is expectations about the future, um, and optimism bias is expecting things to be better than they end up being. Um, but you can have negative expectations. So I can expect the market, stock, my stocks, to go down, but if they go down even more than I expected, it's still an optimism bias. And then you have hope, and hope is just ex wanting things to be, to be good and believing that they will be good. Thank you very much. You will be around, I think, I will, for, for a few yeah. hours more. So I know there are two or three, three more people with questions. If, if you can actually uh, waylay tally at some point uh, before the end of the day, I'm sure you'll, you'll find an answer. Sorry about that. Thank you very Thank much you. indeed. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you.